Welcome back everyone to the seventh annual Life Sciences BC Invest in BC conference presented by Lumera Ventures. Thank you for those who participated in the earlier two pitch sessions. They were all excellent. Lots of really fantastic innovation and discovery that people were able to give us an overview of. If you are interested in reviewing the sessions, if you weren't able to make them, um, please note that they are recorded and that can be accessed through the main stage. This is our third and final session featuring therapeutics companies. And here today to introduce them is Jonathan Jafari, Lead Executive in Residence, Human Health Venture Studio of Entrepreneurship at UBC. Before I pass the floor on to John, I want to remind everyone to post any questions you have in the Q&A area of the platform on the right-hand side of your screen. While the uh, presenters will not be answering them live through their pitches, they will reach out to you after. So feel free to reach out to um, anybody on the platform for that matter. Um, there's lots of great connections that can be made in the 250 plus people that have registered for the conference this year. Also, there, we've created a presenting guide of all the companies that are pitching over the next few days, and it will be posted in the chat shortly. So please take a look at that to provide to see a quick snapshot of all of the companies presented. With that, I will pass it over to Jonathan. Great. Thank you, Wendy. Very much appreciate and appreciate all the support from LSBC and Lumira. Excellent. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm happy to be in Entrepreneurship UBC and uh, also seeing all of the ventures that we work with uh, presenting at the in, uh, Invest in BC uh, presented by Lumira uh, sh Showcase. Here we go. So Entrepreneurship UBC, we've been around for about uh, 10 years now. Um, we have a dual mandate, enriching the educational experience of students, which includes uh, undergraduate, graduate postdocs, and uh, PIs, as well as uh, uh, different workers at UBC, and provide them with opportunities to become entrepreneurial thinkers. And then really working with different uh, ventures, uh, building transformational, transformational ventures that positively shape and impact our economy and society. I think what one thing that's unique with us is we work very early in the entrepreneurial process, and we do this by inspiring, educating, and uh, building the different ventures. And we have really no focus on terms of uh, monetary return. We also focus very much on uh, uh, positive return for the community, uh, which is a bit unique, and we've been very successful. So um, in terms of uh, the economic impact, we've had a number of companies go through EUBC over the past 10 years. Lots of jobs being created, uh, revenue, financing, et cetera. A lot of mentors in our community, which I think is super important. We couldn't do it without our mentors. Uh, we engage our students. I'll go into that a little bit further in a bit, uh, but we've supported 650 ventures. And I think importantly, which is not uh, ca captured here, sorry, is that some of the ventures that are successful, the, the mentors and the, the PIs actually come back and work with some of our other ventures. So um, how we support uh, entrepreneurship, uh, our entrepreneurs is really, uh, we have a very much formal program where we do a business model validation, um, deep mentoring with a number of different uh, mentors, val volunteers, as well as uh, EUBC staff. Uh, we have uh, venture incubation state through our hatch ventures and access to funding opportunities. So that's access to um, different like my tax supports as well as sort of non-dilutive financing as well as um, risk investment capital. Uh, so in terms of how we work with the community, um, we, we actually work with, um, we have our own entrepreneurial program called Lab to Launch and Core, uh, where we have a very programmatic way to work with our um, UBC partners, faculty and staff. And then we also partner with uh, groups like SBME Propels. And I, I see that Daniel Walker is, a, is a, another, a, again, a very high uh, networker in this, uh, in this event. Um, Vancouver Coastal Health Research Institute, Providence Skunk Works, and then Digital Health Week. Um, really, our goal is to get ventures ready for uh, other programs as well, such as the Genome BC Pilot Innovation Fund, Creative Destruction Labs, uh, LSBC Investor Readiness. And I, I should point out that we have a number of EUBC uh, current and graduate companies that are part of the LSB, LSBC Investor Readiness Program. Um, and then we do our own studio programming, such as target product profile training, minimal vial product, greeting our lab, and then we have uh, social events, and uh, last but not least, a studio newsletter. 
Uh, and so what's, uh, we have different uh, startups in very different areas of, of uh, human health. So medical device, drug delivery, digital health, research tools, um, transplantation, et cetera. And so we, all these companies essentially go through the entrepreneurial programming, and then we provide sort of specific help in terms of their, uh, their area of interest and, uh, and through mentorship as well as secondary resources. And you can see a number of different companies uh, in the drug delivery, drug development and delivery space are presenting uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, I should point out Sustain Therapeutics, uh, Sarah Jean, uh, Aerosmith is part of our Entrepreneurial Explorer program, sort of more of a light touch. Um, and then uh, the company that I run, which is uh, Mesentel Therapeutics. Uh, and so this is uh, just a slide of a, a successful company, you know, overnight success, total flow medical, but really um, they were, they were, did the uh, entrepreneurship UBC program. They did the creative destruction labs, health stream at Mari Academy. And they also completed the life science uh, BC's investor readiness program. And then they ultimately raised uh, 5.5 million seed round to get their product in the clinic. And uh, this is a huge success. Uh, we're a non-competitive, very helpful group. And we look forward to working with more ventures to see them come through um, the LSBC Investor Readiness Program and ultimately raise funds. Uh, so with that, thank you. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And I guess I'd like to call the first uh, presenter today, uh, Dr. Peter Sterling, co-founder and CEO, Aerosmith Genetics. Peter, take it away. Okay. Um, can everybody see my screen? Jonathan? I can only see the presentation, so I hope it's all good. I can see it. Thanks. Perfect. Jonathan? And uh, we definitely acknowledge uh, interacting with you at EUBC was a, was a productive and continues to be a productive thing. So really happy to be here today to tell you about our venture. My name is Peter Sterling. I'm at the Cancer Foundation uh, during the day. And along with Phil Heater and Nigel O'Neill, scientists at UBC, we founded Aerosmith about a year ago. We have sort of received support from the Creative Destruction Lab here in Vancouver, as well as scientific advice from people in our circle in Canada and the US that have uh, experience in the startup and academic space. So Aerosmith is envisioned as a precision oncology biotechnology platform company, specifically right now focusing on the synthetic lethal space in cancer therapy. So synthetic lethality is this concept in precision medicine that proposes to link genetic biomarkers in tumors to specific uh, tumor specific drug targets in other pathways. And these kinds of genetic interactions have been conceived and applied for cancer therapy for about 25 years preclinically in the research lab and in companies. And as you can see on the right here, we've been quite successful in identifying candidate targets. There are some proposals that up to a thousand human proteins might be good synthetic lethal targets in some settings, but at present only a single class of drugs uses synthetic lethality as its rationale that's FDA approved today. And those are PARP inhibitors. And there's maybe another 15 or so targets that are um, in various stages of clinical trials. So to us, this represents a significant bottleneck, right? We've got a thousand candidates and one that's FDA approved. And we think that one of the problems with this bottleneck, one of the reasons for this bottleneck is how we approach preclinical modeling of these genetic interactions. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I mean. Right now, Aerosmith is focused on in the DNA repair space. This is a hot area for cancer therapies because DNA repair helps tumor cells survive. It represents a highly interconnected and partially overlapping um, machine with dozens of components that work together to allow cancer cells to divide rapidly and avoid stresses that normally would kill them. So what our competitors do in the academic or the industrial space often to look for synthetic lethal interactions is to delete pieces of this of the cell or of this machine. So by removing a piece of the machine, you hope that you will uncover a tumor specific genetic dependency. Now, what limits this approach often is that there's redundancy built into this system. And so if you remove a piece of the machine, another component can keep the wheels turning, basically. And this is in stark contrast to how DNA repair inhibitors that are useful in the clinic actually work. So if we look at PARP inhibitors, for example, when a PARP inhibitor is added to a cell, rather than removing the protein from the system or deleting it, it actually freezes the PARP protein in place, trapping it on DNA, basically like poisoning a car. 
And that prevents other repair pathways from coming in and rescuing or compensating for this. And so in certain settings, PARP inhibitors are very effective. Now, this is also true for a class of chemotherapies that have been in use for decades, the topoisomerase inhibitors. There too, the protein itself is converted into the cytotoxic agent by interacting with one of these trapping inhibitors. So I hope you can see the tension here. We have preclinical modeling happening by deleting genes or removing them from the system and hoping to find genetic interactions that are going to translate. But what works in the clinic is actually a protein drug complex that poisons the machine and ultimately kills the cell. So we think we can do a lot better in our preclinical modeling by letting genetics do the work. We're all geneticists by training, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we propose to do this. But by creating large genetic libraries, we can create better models of a protein drug complex that should be translatable in the, in the synthetic lethal space. So I was torn about whether or not to leave this slide up. It's a rather complex snapshot of our platform uh, writ large. So the important components I want to walk you through are two and three here. So we can use our, our data and our knowledge to identify high priority targets. And then the target protein of interest enters our mutational target mapping pipeline. This is a proprietary set of methods that basically starts out by us creating tens of thousands of mutations in a target protein. So we create you know, 10 or 100,000 mutations in a target and use cell-based screens to ask which of those single amino acid changes convert the protein into a cytotoxic form, just like we want when we ultimately have a, a trapping inhibitor, for example. So all this data actually creates a bit of a map. So we have a protein structure, and then mapped onto its surface, we have all the places we can change it to turn that protein into a cytotoxic form. That allows us to design smart drug discovery screens using in silico or biochemical approaches to get hits that go into sort of more standard preclinical development. This works. So for our lead program, we send mutations in this protein and use cell-based screens to ask which mutations give rise to a dominantly DNA damaging form of the protein. So um, I hope you can see this movie here. So this is a protein structure in ribbon form. The colors here are mutations that turn this protein into a cytotoxic agent. Important thing here is the yellow residues, that's the active site. That's where competitors would be looking for inhibitors for this enzyme. Now, what you hope you can see is there's this arch that protrudes up the top with red amino acids highlighted along its length. That allowed us to design a new in silico docking screen that actually gave us a new class of inhibitors for this enzyme um, in vitro. And now we're expanding that class and developing IP around this. So the pipeline then allows us to take any target, a, an essential gene, a, a redundant gene, and ask, can we convert it with mutagenesis into a therapeutic agent? That map then tells us how to design a smart drug discovery screen to get to a, a new hit compounds faster. So this, this is active sites. We can find backdoor allosteric sites and enzymes, uh, and we have the models uh, to do iterative analysis as we go through this drug development process. So novel target strategies faster. Right now, as I mentioned, we have a, a detailed map for one program that's led to a drug discovery screen and a novel family of inhibitors. And we have a very detailed map for a second target uh, that we're now using to design new drug discovery approaches. For another 10 genes, we have proof of concept that you could actually, you can convert this enzyme into a dominant cytotoxic form and therefore it's worth you know, going and doing a deep mutational map of, the, of its structure. Um, so what we want to do, you know, this company is currently based uh, in incubator space at UBC and fed through uh, our, our labs generating IP through the uh, uh, licensing process that's happening now or it's almost concluded. And so what we're really proposing to do is in the next year and a half, capitalize the company um, and raise about 1.2 million Canadian that would allow us to fund two key hires to accelerate the platform proofing and optimization to do medicinal chemistry on our lead asset. Um, to identify hit compounds for three additional targets, probably derived from about five mutational maps. And really uh, critically important for us is to attract business expertise to the venture. We're all scientists, we're all first time founders, and we recognize this is something that we're gonna need to grow. One of the goals of this funding is to really enter into discussions by the end of it with our first customers, which we envision as larger pharma that we would hope to partner with on development for some of our um, new assets. So. I can leave this up here. Uh, we're based at UBC in Amgen Golden Ticket Incubator Space. We develop small molecules that aim to convert DNA repair proteins into cytotoxic agents themselves. 
And we have this pipeline um, that we're licensing from UBC, uh, from our academic labs, that opens the target space incredibly to uh, uh, new, new targets as well as new sites on existing targets. So I will stop there and I'll look forward to some questions in the chat. Just uh, before I stop, I will post a white paper and version of the slide deck if anybody's interested in more details in the chat now as well. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Peter. Great presentation and very exciting technology. Uh, next up is Dr. Chris Tam. She's the co-founder and CEO of Integrated Nanotherapeutics. Chris. Thank you, Jonathan. Let me try to share my screen. Can you see it okay, Jonathan? Yes, looks great, Chris, thanks. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Chris Tam. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of Integrated Nanotherapeutics, or INT in short. INT is a spin-out company from the University of British Columbia lab a few years ago. We are a lipid nanoparticle development company, and we are also making new nanomedicines for autoimmune disease. In autoimmune diseases such as lupus, MS, fertiligo, et cetera, the system is attacking our own cells and organs. For a lot of these diseases, the go-to treatment is common um, immunosuppressant, leading to shutdown of the immune system. The patient becomes immunocompromised and they have other infections such as the common cold, flu, or COVID-19. Sure, uh, we're stopping the immune system from attacking our own cells and organs, but we are also stopping the normal immune function. This sledgehammer approach is inappropriate for most people, especially children and people with comorbidities. In order to fundamentally treat autoimmune disease, we need to train the immune system to not attack our own cells. INT has a solution for this. Our solution is similar but different in function to the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine. So let me talk a little bit about the mRNA vaccine on the left-hand side of this slide. In the vaccine, there is a little LMP in short, wrapping a piece of mRNA and coding an antigen. For COVID-19, the antigen is the spike protein of the virus. After injection into our body, our immune system sees the LMP, reacts to it, makes antibodies, and attacks the virus. This is good stuff as we all know it. Our solution is similar with an extra detail. The detail on the right-hand side in the diagram molecule immune modulator in the same lipid nanoparticle that contains the mRNA. The mRNA in this case for autoimmune disease is an autoantigen, it's encoding an autoantigen. For example, in type one diabetes, the autoantigen can be insulin. For celiac disease, the autoantigen can be transglutaminase. So after injection, our immune system sees the LMP. The immune modulator small molecule tells the immune system to react to the autoantigen. Do not produce antibodies. Do not attack our own cells and organs. This is what we call the antigen-specific immune tolerance. We have compelling in vitro and in vivo data showing suppression of antigen-specific T-cell proliferation, suppression of autoantibody production, as well as induction of regulatory T-cells, the good T-cells. We have IP surrounding this technology. Our scientists are working hard of autoimmune diseases at the moment, but this is just the beginning. As you can see, this approach can be applied to other antigen-based uh, disorders, such as organ transplant rejection, anti-drug antibody responses, as well as allergies. The therapeutic approach in the previous slide is enabled in a multi-cargo lipid nanoparticle system. By multi-cargo, we mean we can load various drug modalities in the same LMP. For example, we can put two different small molecules in the same LMP, or we can put a small molecule with a macromolecule such as DNA, RNA, or peptide in the same LMP system. For our immune 
uh, diseases application in the previous slide, we put small molecule immunomodulator together with an mRNA encoding and autoantigen. We can also engineer the LMP such that they accumulate in cells and tissues of interest. For our autoimmune disease applications, our focus is immune cells. Again, we have a robust IP surrounding the LMP technology here. As you know, there are many LMP companies out there. How are we different from other platforms? We are differentiated in three areas. One, our different drug modalities. Two, we can co-load different drug modalities in the same LMP. We can mix and match small molecule with macromolecule. Uh, combination therapy is, is now uh, easily achieved. And three, for small molecules, we can control the drug release rate from the lipid nanoparticle. Diagram on the right-hand side shows that there are companies who are very good at delivering nucleic acid, such as Acuitas, who is very good at delivering mRNA in LMP, there are other companies who are very good at delivering small molecules. INT sit in the middle. Our technology allows loading of various drug modalities in the same lipid nanoparticle, enabling combination therapy, as well as our uh, therapeutic approach. Our business model has two arms. On the left-hand side is the internal therapeutic program in autoimmune disease that I've mentioned two slides ago. There we have strong preclinical data to prove our concept, and the program is powered by the multi-cargo LMP system. We figured that other people can use our LMP system as well. So on the right-hand side, we have been working with um, national and international partners to go develop LMP drug formulations in their disease of interest. So there we have been learning from our partners and our own work to de-risk the technology and process in our therapeutic program. Also, we are using the proceeds from working with the partners to fund our internal therapeutic program. Um, in the past several years, we've had good revenue growth. Uh, the graph on the lower right is actually real. Uh, in 2022, we're expecting a revenue in the healthy seven figure range. We have quite a bit of experience in this area. Our team has collectively 100 plus years of experience in drug delivery, especially in lipid nanoparticle development. Our co-founding team has formed 12 companies, including Acuitas Therapeutics and Precision Nanosystems in Vancouver. But most importantly, our co-founding team has contributed five out of 14 approved lipid nanomedicines, including the first in class LMP siRNA on Patro, as well as the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. I mentioned earlier, we are spin out from uh, Professor Peter Collis' lab at the UBC. So our scientific expertise spans from LMP development, LMP vaccine development, to type one diabetes, immunology, organic chemistry, and immune tolerance. At the moment, uh, we have 13 employees in the company, excluding the scientific advisors. This is a snapshot of where we are in terms of our external co-development pipeline as well as the internal therapeutic pipeline. We have been self-sustaining so far um, with uh, um, uh, working with external partners. However, we plan to raise $5 million by the end of next year to accelerate our internal development program, therapeutic program, uh, specifically uh, we plan to use the funds to prepare pre-IND package for our first tolerance asset. Additionally, we plan to advance the tolerance platform to two additional indications to form a true pipeline. And three, we like to expand our patent portfolio, portfolio in other uh, immune disease areas. Thank you so much for your attention, for your time. Uh, this is my contact information. I'd love to talk more about uh, the science the strategy and our, our plan to grow the company. Thank you. I'm going to unshare. Excellent, thank you very much, Chris. I'd love to see the differentiated uh, lipid nanoparticle uh, technology. Thank expanding you. upon the, the huge, uh, huge industry we have in Vancouver, excellent. Uh, next, we have Sharon Sidhu. She's the Vice President of Scientific Research, Innovation, and Laboratory Operations at Numinous Wellness. 
Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for the introduction. I am going to try and share my screen and see if this works. And... Okay. All right. Excellent. Um, okay. Again, my name is Sharon Sidhu. I'm the VP of uh, Scientific Research Innovation and Lab Ops at Numinous Wellness. Um, I actually sit at Numinous Bioscience, which is the research and development leg of the organization. Um, our our uh, scope of work is research development and discovery and innovations in psychedelic medicine. I'm sure it's uh, everybody's heard of that now, seeing as it's uh, all the rage and in all the news. Uh, we are essentially uh, where all the R&D happens. We're on the path to discovery of potential benefits of psychedelic medicine in other conditions with pronounced comorbidities of depression and anxiety. Uh, we have a house of internal expertise in mycology, chemistry, immunochemistry, uh, phytochemistry, formulation, and extraction. Um, we have a lot of state-of-the-art equipment, and this allows us to uh, develop patented technologies for efficiencies in production of psychoactive mushroom species and uh, delivery of stable and sustainable medicines for the use of specific disease paradigms with proven bioactivity, safety, and efficacy. Um, we have a research team of uh, currently three. So Sarah Newman, who's our mycologist, Jonathan Andrade, who's our formulation scientist, and Adam Warbling, who's our phytochemist. Uh, we are backed uh, by our advisors, Dr. Evan Lewis, Dr. Paul Spagliano, and Dr. Corey Harris, um, who uh, help us with our neurology, preclinical, and uh, phytochemistry. We have a controlled drugs and substances license uh, issued by Health Canada. We are under the purview of the narcotics regulations. We have a very holistic license, which allows us to do activities of possession, production, assembly, uh, sale provision, and transportation, delivery, and sending. Uh, our current list of um, substances include ketamine, LSD, mescaline, DMT, MDMA, psilocybin, psilocin, harmalin, harmalol, uh, psychedelic mushrooms, as well as San Pedro cactus. Our four major initiatives that we're working on currently include the generation of uh, process and technology driven patents, uh, the development of validated and verified psychoactive species mushroom bank, uh, the discovery and research and development of targeted and non targeted, targeted psilocybe derivative. Uh, finished drug products and the de development of validated test methods for complex drug matrices uh, derived from psilocybe mushrooms and aligned technical specifications. Uh, today I'm just going to focus on three, which is essentially our drug development platform. Just want to give you a few numbers on the mental health crisis that we are seeing right now. Uh, in any given year, one in five Canadians are experiencing a mental illness. Um, this really affects uh, young people aged 15 to 24 who are most likely to experience a mental illness or substance use disorder. And um, the mental health uh, illnesses and substance use disorders are the leading cause of disability in Canada and can cut um, someone's lifespan from 10 to 20 years, um, which again compounds that number. And about 4,000 Canadians per year die by suicide, which is an average of about 11 suicides a day. What our focus is, is that mental health and uh, physical health are linked. So people with long-term physical health conditions, such as chronic pain, are much more likely to also experience mood disorders. And conversely, people with a mood disorder are at a much higher risk of developing a long-term medical condition. So this chart came uh, from a paper uh, that was published in 2020, looking at comorbid depression in medical diseases. And what we see are several different categories. So coincidence of medical disease and depression, therapy related. So if you're given a specific condition that can call a specific um, medication for a medical disease that causes depression as a side effect, um, behavioral, 
uh, converging biology and uh, psychosocial. We're very much focused on that converging biology um, and depression uh, linked to medical disease. One of the examples given here is higher cortisol in patients with major depressive disorder, which then contributes to medical disease. Um, another um, example here of medical disease causing depression is neurogeneration of lesions, so in Parkinson's or MS and stroke, uh, which causes emotional irregularity. So what do we know? We know that uh, psychedelic medicines, specifically um, uh, psilocybin or its uh, metabolite uh, psilocin, acts as a uh, analog of serotonin and engages in uh, serotonin receptors in the central nervous system. What we're missing is a lot of the research done on the peripheral effects of serotonin and where psilocin can possibly have an effect. This includes vascular tone, homeostasis, cell regeneration, heart function or organ development, intestinal motility, immunomodulation and others. So we know that these components um, engage serotonin receptors. We know that the synergistic compounds modulate the effect and have additional benefits. And this leads to the conversation about comorbidities that may benefit from psychedelic therapy. The other, active, um, the other component of serotonin pathway is inflammation, and it's quite, um, quite involved. Um, so we know that we see an increase in inflammatory markers in people with depression. This has implications for neuroinflammatory conditions and also conditions like Crohn's, rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune diseases. We're really focused on neuroinflammatory and neurological conditions. So again, when we're looking at things like traumatic brain injury, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis. This is just a quote from Dr. Evan Lewis. So an obvious use for psychedelics in the context of neurological diseases is to treat the comorbid mental health conditions that arise from the hardship of being diagnosed and living with one of these diseases. So there's a couple of ways that we've looked at this, and one of them is looking at depression as being um, the condition. So if we look at depression being the condition, and I'm just going to pick on ALS as being the condition that we're looking at depression in. So we have a 50% rate of comorbidity of depression. The other um, comorbidities in this are paralysis, muscle weakness, and gastric, is uh, gastric issues. So if we are looking at a condition like ALS, and we are targeting depression, then we also have the ability to look at the effects of our medications that we're developing on some of these other comorbidities that can then get spun off into a separate trial. And because we already have some of the safety data and the initial data, we're not starting from scratch on some of these other comorbidities. The other way of looking at it is looking at the biochemistry. So again, when we're looking at neurological conditions, uh, the ones listed here, Parkinson's, epilepsy, Alzheimer's and ALS, and we look at the commonalities of the biochemistry, as well as some of the comorbidities on the periphery. In this example that we have, uh, what we see here, adenosine deficiency sits in the middle of some of these conditions that have common comorbidities. So at Bioscience, again, we're looking at drug discovery and efficacy of natural compounds from the Salsabee species. Um, we're using our next generation analytical tools uh, to discover some of these compounds that we haven't seen before. So we're looking at discovery and characterization of compounds of therapeutic benefit beyond indole alkaloids, discovery and characterization of new compounds with potential bioactivity and therapeutic benefits, and the development of pathway for novel compounds for in vitro and in vivo safety and efficacy studies. This is a typical drug development pathway that we see uh, in most companies. We're also compounded with looking at the formulation and stabilization of the compounds that we're looking at in a complex matrix. So along with the discovery and development and preclinical and clinical studies, we're also doing a lot of formulation studies and we're looking at stabilization of both drug substance and drug product and long-term stability and viability uh, for these products to be sold in the market. Our current pipeline, uh, we have two formulations, uh, NBio04, Indications are multiple, the formulation is complete, technical specifications are complete, and we are in the middle of uh, submitting our master file um, and looking at doing our phase one clinical trial for that um, early next year. 
For n bio 0 5 which is our second formulation, we are looking at neurological conditions. I've listed two here, which is ALS and post-concussion syndrome. And our current um, activity right now is stabilization of that formulation. And we are also looking at setting up the bioactivity assays as our next milestone for this project. The interesting thing about looking at something like depression um, as a comorbidity um, in ALS is that um, we can also use the same formulation for what we're calling lower uh, neurological conditions. An example given here is concussion. So for concussion, you don't need the same amount of regulatory burden that uh, ALS has. So you could formulate a product and get it into a concussion study, either as a early clinical trial, as a, um, as a special access case, or even as a N of one clinical trial as well. So this allows us to actually push our products into uh, 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 patient populations sooner than waiting for a marketed approved product uh, through the Health Canada and the FDA process. Current pathway of development, as I said before, we are compounded with um, actually producing the product as well and stabilizing our product. Uh, with natural products, we're also looking at the first portion being strain selection. And this is based on the metabolomic profile of the initial strains that we're looking at. Um, second part of this project is the bioactivity and disease modeling. It's our proof of concept. We have three proof of concepts that we're working on. Uh, the next part would be preclinical studies, uh, inclusive of ADME and toxicity um, and et cetera. And then our early phase one studies for safety. Uh, this could be a, a dose finding study, a PK uh, or a comparative to just psilocybin. And then later on, we're looking at our phase 2A, 2B studies. And this would be the assessment of efficacy in patient population as well as safety as well. On the formulation side, again, we're looking at strain isolation. So this is aligning our metabolome with our genomics and uh, phenotype of the strains that we are looking at. Uh, looking at extractions that don't um, interfere with the integrity of our meta metabolomic uh, fingerprint. And then stabilization of the formula so that the actual finished product is viable. And then the efficient scale up um, uh, to ensure that our critical checkpoints for our technical specifications still hold on mass batch production. I've listed some of our milestones and uh, associated costs. Um, so we are looking at being complete for our validated strain uh, by um, next year, uh, if, uh, financial 2023, uh, looking at our disease uh, modeling and bioactivity to be completed also in the same time frame, And then following on with our clinical studies to be completed, uh, preclinical studies to be completed early uh, sorry, not early, but during the period of uh, 2024, and then our phase one study to be completed um, early 2025, and our phase uh, 2A and 2B to be completed uh, between uh, three quarters of financial year 2025. For the stabilization of our product, we're looking again, starting, we've already started these, these projects, stabilization starting now, um, finishing uh, next year, um, and then compounded with that drug substance and drug, drug product. And this also, this timeline does also include uh, stability parameters for long-term uh, stability, short-term stability, as well as challenge testing, and then uh, scaling up and batch production so that we are ready to do mass production for uh, 2025. We have looked at a financial summary over the next uh, three years. We would be, we're looking at about an $8 million spend to get this product for um, ALS into the phase two clinical trials. We do have internal expertise and resources that do, do make this outlook look slightly um, more attractive on the financial front with what we do at Numinous Bioscience, uh, the compound discovery and characterization, the bioactivity, the cell line studies, the target assessment, formulation studies, product development, as well as all the requirements for regulatory uh, submission. So the chemistry manufacturing components, the master file, the investigational brochure, as well as the licenses that we hold, uh, which is our controlled drugs and substances license, moving into a drug establishment license soon as well. Uh, the Neurology Center uh, in Toronto is where Dr. Evan Lewis sits. He, uh, as one of our advisors, can also conduct the studies, uh, look at study parameters, uh, be a clinical research site, 
build up the treatment expertise, um, develop the condition specific services, as well as the special access program, and then work with uh, their team to drive expertly uh, driven uh, clinical trial protocols, as well as help with the uh, investigators brochure. And then our CEDA clinical research site um, uh, can implement the clinical trials and monitor the sites and act as the um, medical monitor. We have uh, the ability to generate assets and value. So through this whole process, we have a number of different assets that we are generating over the next uh, three years, uh, which help with value uh, for the organization. And then we have three patent um, families, process-driven, delivery-driven, and indication-driven. Process-driven, we've already submitted an application. We are waiting, we should get our PCT by the end of November. We have two applications that are being prepared for um, delivery, and we're scoping out our indication-specific patents at the moment. We also have the opportunity for short-term revenue generation as well to cover some of these costs and be somewhat more self-sufficient, uh, inclusive of contract manufacturing, uh, study supply, uh, the special access program. We've seen some changes in regulations in Alberta, as well as some changes in the US. Uh, we have licensable technologies as far as stabilization goes, cultivation and extraction. And then we always have contract services as well for standardized analytical testing, storing and logistics, sale of starting materials, and the development of isolates. Um, drug market, we all know, is growing. Um, 2020 numbers showed $13.5 billion uh, of the market with a 7.2% compound annual growth rate between 2021 and 2027. Um, there is a competitive advantage for partnerships and innovation, as well as there seems to be more a study going on with uh, SSRIs and other indications, nerve pain being one of them. Thank you for listening. Excellent. Thank you, Sharon. It's great to see new technologies being uh, pursued for mental health disorders. Much appreciated. Uh, our next presenter is Michael Zimmerman. He's the CEO of Platform Life Sciences. Hello, everyone. I'm assuming you see the screen. Yes, we can see it. Please go. Go ahead. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Zimmerman. I'm the CEO of Platform Life Sciences, and we are on a mission to modernize clinical trials on a global footprint. You probably know that the single drug development, um, all the way to bringing it to market, costs on average $2 billion on average, off average, and clinical trials are a good chunk of this uh, budget and timeline. And a lot of the value chain from discovery to market of drug um, development have been modernized, clinical trials have not. And we see huge opportunity to compress the timelines, reduce the cost, and modernize this field. Um, a little bit of a fact sheet about our company. We are an expert team. We've been in this space for 15 years. And the market we are after, which is clinical trial, phase one all the way to phase three, is sized at $75 billion. So it's a massive industry that have moved very little over the last few decades. Um, we have already in the bag $60 million investment so we have a huge vision to pursue as far as the size of the company and what at the core of what we are doing is a modern scientific approach building master protocols that are focused on disease and patients and not on a single drug and building an infrastructure to accept new drugs and new intervention into the platform where most of the work was pre-done um, we have tested our science and our global network during the COVID days. We performed the TOGETHER trial, which tested 12 interventions in 
23 months. Many of them were published. We received the clinical trial of the year, received a lot of visibility, and um, it was it worked for us really well. Based on that, we received a very rich funding. And we have already two paying customers, totaling $11 million. And we have five additional customers in the early pipeline. We are now 31 employees strong and going very, very fast. And a little bit, a couple of words about the market. You all know this is a huge market, more than half a trillion dollar of sales of the top 50 biopharma. And there are 6,000 drugs uh, being developed in a pipeline which will need a lot of clinical trial infrastructure. And the clinical trial spend, um, the market size by CROs, the one that execute clinical trial is at $46 billion in just two years. So big numbers here. And if we look at, clinic, at the, the drug development from the scientific research all the way to market access, clinical trials is a big, big piece of the budget and the timeline. And it's actually not only have not been modernized, it's actually going backward because there is a drop in productivity, which means success ratio to the budget spent. Um, the uh, number of trials needed is going, so more infrastructure. They are increasing in duration, um, and there are more drugs developed that need um, clinical trials. So becomes clinical trials become a major bottleneck in the industry. Now, we were all told that because of being heavily regulated, um, clinical trial is what they are. They cannot be compressed in timeline and cannot be compressed in budget, but COVID came and changed everything because if before COVID, an average approval cycle for vaccine was 112 months, um, during COVID and post-COVID, the average um, is seven months. So FDA and EMEA and regulators, regulatory bodies can flex their muscles and um, can push forward when there is sufficient science and evidence and patient recruitment and all other metrics uh, hold. So how we are going to do that? Um, if you look at clinical trial, particularly phase three, they are, they are built from a design stage, startup stage, executing or conducting the clinical trial, and then of course the closeout. But if we use a concept which is adaptive platform trial, a lot of the infrastructure for accepting the drug can be done ahead of time, ahead of the drug. Um, building the site, the site contracts, the developing of the protocol, the core biostatistical plan, many of the regulatory um, elements. And by deploying the science of adaptive platform trial, which at the heart of it is approving a master protocol, accept a, a small per drug, compressed massively the timeline for the uh, clinical trial. And we add to that operational efficiencies by developing global network of sites and partners which are executing the trial simultaneously in many um, different geographies. So our try uh, is go where the disease is or where the patients are, and therefore we can compress even more the timeline of the trial of the adaptive platform trial. And with these two elements, the science of adaptive platform trial and the global network, we are able to shave 50% off the duration of the clinical trial, including all the elements of inclusion, exclusion criteria, and screening uh, patients. And this is, we believe, massive. Um, we have scientific team and biostatistic team, regulatory team. Um, we build master protocols that um, are approved by the FDA and the EMEA and some local regulator in the geography we are operate. And um, 
working closely with the sites, pre-investing in the infrastructure around the world, and deploying our platform, our infrastructure in different localities, and, and simply being prepared for the drugs and the intervention in the disease area we are focused. So for example, uh, we developed a platform for um, respiratory viral diseases, which accept um, intervention for influenza, for COVID-19, developing a platform, adaptive platform um, for long COVID, which will accept um, long COVID different therapeutics and so on. So adaptive platforms designed for a certain disease area. And the status quo of the industry, well, you have a new drug, a new intervention, you go off and design your protocol, you get it approval by the regulatory bodies, you go figure out where will be the patients and the sites, what is the data plan, the technology infrastructure, train the sites, and then execute the trial. We believe we build a platform which all these steps are done ahead of time, and then we can test multiple drugs like we did in the TOGETHER trial um, when they are becoming available. And it's, the trial is adaptive, which means we do many interim analysis and able um, to change the parameters of the randomization, the parameters of the biostatistics to get to a result very, very fast. Um, we have conducted the TOGETHER trial, the TOGETHER platform for COVID interventions, um, highly published in multiple journals, received the clinical trial of the year. This is the progression of the adaptive platform trials with multiple drugs, multiple interim analyses. As you see, it responds in real time to the standard of care and to the different effectiveness of the drugs. And basically, at the bottom line, can compress timeline and reduce uh, costs. The final point I would like to bring in is that we are building a new business model for clinical trials. And the reason being that there are many geographies and countries that want to advance their clinical research. And therefore, there, is, there are many grants a lot of government program support that are helping us building this clinical trial infrastructure in those geographies where you have a lot of patients population. Hence, by working collaboratively with these geographies, we are able to, believe, to build the infrastructure with disease and patients focus. And therefore, um, the drug companies unlike what they've done in the past, where they have to cover the cost of building the infrastructure and um, spending the money to test their own drugs, we remove the investment in the infrastructure, and which is pre-built for this disease area, and the drug companies simply pay only the variable cost, which is specific, specific to, for their intervention. So kind of fusing World Health Organization grants, foundations, and make it easier for drug companies to test and approve their drugs. Thank you very much. And uh, it was a pleasure to present to you. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Excellent presentation. And uh, I hope that we see a lot of uh, innovative clinical trial solutions for some of our companies that presented today. Uh, our, our next uh, presentation is uh, Mark Godsey. He's the co-founder and CEO and chairman of Pharmaceuticals. Okay. There we go. Do we see that? Uh, yeah, I see it. If you could hit play, I believe that would start the... Uh... Okay, can you see the first slide? 
Can you see yes. the first slide? Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for the organizers and, and uh, the co-presenters. Um, wonderful presentations. Thank you so much. Uh, Mark, my name is Mark Godsey. Mark, can Mark, you hit can the you play button so the, you get the presentation mode? Okay. There we go. Excellent. There. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Again, um, <clears throat> thank you, everybody. My name is Mark Godsey, and I'm the CEO of Shackleford Pharma. Uh, we are a Vancouver-based private clinical stage pharma company focused initially on uh, epilepsy. Now, why epilepsy? Uh, first reason is it's an incredibly devastating disease. It affects some 50 million people around the world with approximately 5 million new cases being diagnosed every year. Uh, those new cases are largely children and adults over the age of 75. And despite the fact that there are some 28 drugs that have been approved to help control uh, epilepsy, over a third of the population base does not, not respond to any medicine. So it is an incredibly difficult disease, to, of course, for the sufferers, but for the families and, and, uh, and the caregivers. The second reason is our very unique history. Um, the photo that you see there is our founder namesake, Dr. Alan Chapelford, who some 12 years ago uh, treated a young five-year-old girl by the name of Charlotte, who was suffering from 300 seizures a week and had a feeding tube and had gone through all the, the, the drugs that, uh, that the doctors had tried to help her. And they were awaiting a horse tranquilizer that had been um, used in horses, approved for horses in Europe, had never been used in, in humans. And of course, desperate circumstances often call for desperate measures. And uh, Dr. Shackelford, who was a Harvard-trained physician, spent seven years doing his residency and postdoc research at, at Harvard, highly, highly intuitive, had read a study uh, that had been done decades before that in uh, a very uh, modest number of, of patients uh, and, uh, and CBD had been used and had shown um, great effect. And so when he saw Charlotte, uh, it was his thought that perhaps maybe that was worth a, worth a shot. And uh, he suggested that it was administered and this young girl's life changed, as did Alan's life change, and, and uh, the medical community, may I suggest, also changed. Um, she went from 300 seizures a week to one or two a month, and uh, it was really nothing short of a, a miracle. So what followed from that is it's hard to keep these miracles um, secret, and Alan very quickly became the subject of a 60 Minutes episode, uh, he was the subject also of a CNN documentary, which is still the most viewed documentary uh, of that of CNN, other than the 911 documentary. And people from all over the world uh, came to visit him in Colorado to seek help and help for conditions that they weren't able to get help with um, using traditional means. And uh, so, again, committed to patients and, and highly intuitive. Over about a 12 year period, Alan treated uh, over 25,000 patients and just a whole waterfront um, of, of indications or, or conditions, and many of which extraordinarily successfully, um, despite the, the lack of success using traditional means. And so with this real world database, um, he asked himself, you know, now what do I do? I can, I can treat people, you know, so many people a day, um, but, you know, how can I scale this? How can I really reach the number of people that I need, uh, need to reach, want to reach? And so he concluded that the only way to do that was to translate these formulations that he had developed into prescription drugs. And, uh, and then thought, well, how do I do that? I really, I guess, have to build a, build a company build a team, and uh, which is where I, how I met him. So my background is I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've, I've been involved in co-founding and helping build uh, many companies, many in the, in the biotech healthcare area, 
including two local companies called IB Biomedical and Angiotech Pharmaceuticals. And of course, in these early stages, money is absolutely critical to support a, a company like this or any other company. And what I've found is that um, people invest typically in teams. And so building a team was, was critically important for this venture to be successful. And, and that we do. And I, if I could, I, I would spend the entire presentation time here talking about our team, if I could. Uh, it includes our head of R&D, who was the head of the neuro portfolio at GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, we also have the person who is the head of global regulatory affairs for Pfizer. Uh, we also have the person who is the head of CMC and formulations uh, for GlaxoSmithKline. We have an absolutely outstanding advisory board um, with tremendous, tremendous depth that includes a gentleman who set the standards for epilepsy uh, for the FDA. And the, the team that, you, that, that I'm describing here have uh, developed and ha had approved some 43 FDA drugs, as you can see on the screen. Really, truly remarkable. And six of those um, come from the epilepsy, epilepsy area. Now, it, why and how could you amass a team like this? Well, the only reason is the incredible real world data that Alan has. And I might suggest that it's not sort of a once in a lifetime, it's really just a once. And it, as we, I think most of us know, you typically start maybe even in a petri dish and, and, and then to animals and ultimately you may get to humans. And with this absolutely wealth of, of human data, uh, we've been able to attract an absolutely extraordinary team. So the team combed through all of the data and uh, we have at least a dozen very, very um, promising uh, opportunities to translate those, uh, that experience into medicine. We also, it also includes many orphans, but of course you have to you know, start in, in one spot. So our lead candidate is what we call P1707. And uh, that formulation has been used in patients that are, the, are amongst the most difficult in the epi epilepsy area. And our uh, immediate market that we will be focusing on represents about 1.3 million patients. In epilepsy, even a modest improvement is extraordinarily significant. Here, this is really quite extraordinary. Um, 133 patient treatment years of data, that represents approximately 25 patients over a five or six year period, and 96% seizure-free. Seizure-free means seizure-free for at least one year, which is really a, a gold platinum standard in, in epilepsy. Um, beyond this, as I mentioned, there's other indications and, and orphan drug, orphan um, uh, possibilities as well. So we have a we have a pipeline um, behind this. So one might ask, well, where are we now? Uh, we obtained a freedom to operate opinion, and based upon that, we filed a provisional patent uh, covering this formulation. And uh, we've met with the uh, FDA. Uh, on a pre-IND basis. And then based upon that, we're now preparing to file the IND. We expect to do that in the second quarter of, of next year. And then uh, start a phase two uh, around the second half of next year. Like the other companies here that have been presenting, um, we are here with our rice bowl and uh, looking for capital to support the company. Uh, we, we are looking for approximately $30 million that will provide the capital to uh, fund our phase two and the remaining CMC work. And, uh, and as, as you can see, we've uh, pegged our valuation at 70 million. That's on the lower end of an independent valuation that we, we carried out. And the reason being is we wanna make sure that this is investor friendly. Uh, we have already received an offer to take the company public by a Wall Street firm, and our commitment is not just to the, the um, families and epileptic patients we, we hope to serve, and those others that, that relate to indications that Alan um, has also worked on, but our commitment is also to investors and to make sure that, that people make money. So in summary here, um, 
Uh, we have an exceptional team uh, with all of the patient uh, data that we have, um, we believe that that lowers the development risk enormously. Uh, we believe that there's some very near-term upside. Companies in the epilepsy space that um, travel through phase two, uh, more often than not, reach unicorn or unicorn plus status. So we're excited about uh, that possibility for our shareholders. There is an extraordinarily large market potentially for our, our, our technology. And of course, um, last but not least, um, we have many, many other uh, opportunities that we are uh, excited to potentially pursue. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, something I, I, I failed to mention in terms of the team. On the corporate side, uh, we have on our board, the person who was uh, the head of global products for AstraZeneca, and we also have, as a special advisor, the uh, ex-CFO of, of uh, GW Pharma. And, uh, and so that, I guess, finishes our presentation. And I would like to thank everybody for your time and welcome everybody to, uh, to look at the chat area. Um, our Jeff Griffiths, is, his email is there. And we would welcome anybody to reach out and, and uh, learn more about our company. This really is just a summary. And, uh, and we welcome everybody to join the very, very noble adventure we, do, we believe we're on in supporting Alan Ch Dr. Alan Chappell for its vision for the world. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. There we go. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Am I out now? I, I forgive uh, I me. Can, I can Sorry. still see your screen. But... Yes. If you can help me pretty please, which button would I hit? Uh, Claire will be doing that. <laughs> I apologize. I'm not actually sure. Okay. Um, but I'm about to wrap there, this up. There we go. There we go. There, there we go. go. <laughs> I... Sorry. I apologize, everybody, for that. I do, the button was over in the corner. You exposed, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. How little I know about sharing screens on this. <laughs> anyway, Mark, thank you. Very impressive um, overview of what's happening at Shackleford, and it was um, really interesting to also hear the how it came how it came to be. Um, so thank you very much for that. With that, I'd like to thank all of our presenters today, Peter, Chris. Sharon, Michael, and Mark. Um, the presentations were extremely interesting and once again demonstrates the breadth of innovation that's happening in life sciences in our, uh, in our ecosystem. I also want to thank Entrepreneurship at EBC um, and Jonathan for moderating the session. And with that, I'm going to close this session off and our next um, session starts in eight minutes at 2 p.m. PST. Uh, for the first panel discussion of the conference sponsored by AstraZeneca and titled Precision Medicine, the Future of Companion Diagnostics. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you in a few minutes.